So my name is uh, Amanda Wozniak, I go by Woz, and uh, I'm coming to you as uh, actually just as an individual and not representing uh, anyone. I actually started doing open source hardware publicly about 10 years ago. And in fact, I found this clip from my first presentation on how you don't need to be an MIT engineer, you can make hardware too. So the focus of this talk is really going to be more of a story. I've presented at the Open Hardware Summit a couple of times, and it's always sort of dropping like, here's how I do my job in a nutshell. And this is actually moving away from individual expertise and talking about um, how the community can succeed. So first off, I'm gonna take a step back and say, what does it take to make great things happen? And anything, any human endeavor is a combination of technology, people, and process. And here the technology is the hardware we wanna build nominally or the tool, like, you know, and uh, the people is everyone here in, in, in the open hardware community or even in the adjacent communities. And the process is something that the open source hardware movement is really focused on. What does it mean to be open source hardware? Um, you know, what are the, the licensing and methods you can use to make sure that um, things get shared? What are the incentive systems? The, uh, Javier's talk on CERN focused a lot on the process and how a good process can make technology happen. But when you put it another way, it's really about what are our collective goals? Who are the people working towards those goals? And what are the tools that we use? And I'm not joking. It's really, you know, uh, making progress is really about having the right tools, the right squad, and then achieving squad goals. So I'm going to go back in time because this is a story and look at a time a long, long time ago when Alice wanted to write code. So we're taking a step back to software. And here's a brief history of software's increasing utility over time. Back in the day, everything was punch cards and formally provable languages. The original 1950s programming languages required very expert use and, and very dedicated focus to use them. And it actually was a matter of technology invention to get to things that we take for granted today, like object-oriented programming, libraries, linkers, compilers. It wasn't until the late 80s um, that we actually started seeing C++ and really wide adoption of C and C++ because of the altruism of uh, groups like Bell Labs and other open developers saying, I'm going to not only put out a language, I'm going to put out documentation on how to use it, and I'm going to create licensing to allow people to use it basically for free. And then we started seeing a huge explosion of uh, language development in the 90s. And this is hugely in parallel with the history of software development tools. So way back in the day when you were programming in formal languages, your tool deck was a punch card deck. So good luck debugging with that one. Eventually in the mid seventies, we got text editors. And it wasn't until the 2000s that you started actually seeing integrated development environments. And in fact, Eclipse, um, two, two huge things had to happen for like source code development to really be democratized for the masses. One was the release of Eclipse, which was a professionally built, highly integrated development environment given by IBM to everyone else in fact, in part to kick off open software development. The second one was SVN finally bootstrapped itself. And by bootstrapping, I mean SVN was actually in SVN, and then you could continue to contribute to SVN um, uh, if you wanted to do uh, version control, right? So you could now open developers can contribute to the version controls and tools that they use to drive. And so this is where you start seeing just exponential growth in software development. 2005, Git was born out of a, a need for the Linux kernel developer count to go from the single digits to the thousands. And in 2016, GitHub went huge and is actually the single largest repository of code on earth. So what made Eclipse and Git so good that we don't make jokes about punch cards and VI anymore? And that's actually just all of this design that went into it to make it a piece of mature software and a very mature tool. So Eclipse is super user friendly as far as programming interfaces go. It was, it's miles away from anything that came before it. Uh, it includes a lot of user friendly features like syntax highlighting that allow you to see code errors in real time, code navigation, code completion, and it targeted multiple languages and multiple OSs. Even more than that, it's a super powerful and usable tool because it's got everything you need for software development in one spot. You have your code, you have the ability to build to a target, you have a debugger, you have the ability to do unit tests. You can do tracing throughout files, including the library system, and there's source control on the back end. And most importantly, it's free, 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 just all day long. Git, similarly, and uh, credit uh, to uh, Wikipedia and the uh, authors here um, linked to the SVG for this picture because it must be attributed. Um, Git takes the pain. So Eclipse was really for one user to do development and it made 
uh, the bar for development a lot lower for more people, but Git and GitHub really took the pain out of allowing multiple people to coordinate. Now, instead of having you know, one expert user who is your lead developer, you can have a lead developer start a framework and have a lot of other people start contributing through like push, pull, merge, et cetera. So you can have people working on very tiny features and all of a sudden the tree gets hugely dense. Instead of a sparse trunk with a couple of branches of major features that it takes individuals to develop, now the entire community can come in and actually start contributing to the tool set and contributing to anything kept in the tool set. The fun thing about Git and GitHub is they also bootstrap like SVN. They practically build themselves. Like you can make the tools you have better because they're also open source and they're also stored in themselves. And again, it's all free. So using the story of open source software, because that's a lot of parallels are always drawn between open source hardware and open source software. And similarly, when all of this was getting started in the 90s for open source software, everyone was like, how are you ever going to make money doing that? And how are you ever going to enforce quality? let's go ahead and decompile the recipe for this, um, uh, you know, recipe for success into its core ingredients. So one is accessibility. And I put accessibility first because we're not gonna get any, um, any increased velocity if you always restrict um, contrib contribution to a core team of small experts. That is by definition, a small core group. Um, you know, you shouldn't have to be, uh, you know, a degreed engineer with 20 years experience to contribute to open source software or open source hardware. So the goal is to build tools and systems for development that are so usable that novices can contribute more today than an expert could last year with half the swearing. If you make it easier, people will come and they'll want to use it and then you'll start to develop huge amounts of critical mass. Accessible design principles um, that we saw in open source software also apply to open hardware, things like classes and inheritance, libraries. Um, they can be part libraries, circuit libraries, um, example demo libraries for code, seamless linking and building the back end, clean user interfaces, and you know all, all through. The whole point is accessibility is one of the core things that democratizes expertise. By putting all of the expertise into the tool and then making the tool very easy for everyone to use, that's what democratizes development. And CircuitPython is great about this. Um, Fritzine is a really good example where they focused on making a very intuitive interface that goes all the way from concept to, a, you know, ordering a board from OSH Park. And OSH Park itself democratizes like getting a board out to fab. The next part is test. And test is the product behind the product. Um, I'm going to recommend here that you actually go link to Bunny's blog. He's got amazing write-ups from the NETV and all of his different hardware projects on just why test is so important. And he goes into the same test as a product, just like the product you're trying to build, where you care about the usability requirements, it's got to be so reliable, it's actually three or four times the work. And the way to think about test is the longer you go between something you design and being able to prove that it works a million times, uh, is how long it takes you to design the next thing. So all you see in open source software, all of the focus is now getting test time smaller and smaller and smaller until a point where you literally have continuous integration. And imagine what it would do for open hardware if we had the same thing. Next part is automation. So anything involved in development, if it's tedious, error prone, or manual repetition, that's entropy. And entropy leads to the inevitable heat death of the universe and also the death of your project. Profound creativity requires strategic laziness, which means when you find yourself doing something where you think it's a waste of your time, you are strategically lazy by making a way to automate it so you never have to do it again. And then that unlocks all of your free time. Again, talk to Bunny. But automation requires a stable foundation. So automation is actually already happening in open source hardware. It's happening on the software side. So when there's stable hardware bases, like um, mature flavors of open source hardware like Arduino, uh, Adafruit's boards, Circuit Playground, then you can actually automate all of the build and deployment for all of those target boards. And in fact, Adafruit does this today with Circuit Python. They use Git actions to target all of the different boards they support, which means that they can support exponentially more projects for the same amount of boards with a higher and higher and higher and higher quality, higher quality, more success, you know, more better. The next part is scale. And scale is where we get into what GitHub did really, really well. Because even if I'm smart, one me is definitely not smarter than all of you. You scale by making, and actually this was a really good thing that Avia mentioned in the CERN talk, you scale by making tools that the community wants to use, that the community can also support, where when it needs to grow, the community itself is involved in making it better. If we have a lot of um, tools that we're not maintaining, that can be pretty hard to, um, 
pretty hard to scale because everyone's splitting the party. But just like Eclipse was a very well-baked tool that just was put out in the environment for free, you know, we can scale the open source hardware tools as well. We already have KiCad, which has a simulation backend, and we have FreeCAD, and we have Fritzing. But we don't have scaled tools that support things like hierarchical design reuse, or a pool and merge for hardware and circuits, or a unit test and debug in a continuous integration loop in CAD. Right now, the simulation tools we have are very low level. They're not really at the circuit module level, which needs it where it needs to be to be accessible for all of the non-expert users who want to do open source hardware. So these are the sorts of things that, if you build them, will, will scale. And there's one more secret ingredient. And that comes from the lesson of both Bell Labs and IBM. And that secret ingredient is altruism. So why selfishness means that people with expertise, time, and resources actually put a lot of work in to create like things that would normally be closed source in a corporate model, put a lot of energy into actually make those things and give them away for free, because that's what unlocks the exponential potential of everyone to contribute to collective goals. So ultimately, with, some, with, the, like, with circuit simulation, I'm going to go back one slide or two, with things like hierarchical design reuse. That's equivalent to making libraries for hardware. We have part libraries, but we don't have circuit libraries. We don't have sub-assembly libraries. We might have individual circuit tests, but we don't like uh, transistor level tests, but we don't have like shield level tests yet, at least not in an open form for the community to use. But if someone were able, and if people were able to sort of team up and actually build those tools or a group like Altium, you know, worked on some of their concurrent design tools and gave them away for free, we'd see this huge unlock of capability from the open hardware community because we'd have increased expertise in the tools and accessibility for the entire user base. That's real altruism. And, um, but what next, right? Because it's like, okay, well, where am I on the timeline for open source hardware? And the answer is we're actually kind of about 20 years behind open source software. So, you know, Open source hardware started back in, in the 50s, right? With the like slowly. We're kind of back in those days. We have basic hardware CAD and we have low level SIM in the open source community. But we don't yet have the very powerful tools that would be the equivalent of Eclipse. There's a lot of other support for the firmware part, but not the hardware part. And it's when we see this investment in things like um, KiCad and uh, usable hardware unit test that you'll actually see the full collaboration mode come in not too long a time, because that's what it really takes to get everyone to contribute. So the TLDR is <laughs> we really need to continue to support community created tools. And the focus should be to take as much expertise um, from uh, uh, that we have that's required to do hardware well and bury it in that tool, put it in the libraries, put it in the back end, make it um, basically invisible to the front end users, and then use that to build the dream. Thank you very much.